Learning from Boston, How Critical Communication Drove Organizational Coordination. My name is Erin Daly, uh, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, in this webinar, our presenters will review uh, the recent Boston events and best practices, uh, as well as talk about some future vision and lessons learned. After the session, we will have a 15-minute Q&A with our speaker. As a reminder, you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar. You may send your questions by typing in the open text field in the questions panel and sending your question to all panelists. If time runs out, before your question is asked, we will try to follow up with you after the webinar has ended. Links to the recording of the webinar will be available on our blog within a few days of today's session. You can also look for a link to the recording for all of our webinars on everbridge.com under our resources section. If you're on Twitter, we encourage you to take a moment to follow us at, at Everbridge and use the webinar hashtag hash Everbridge to share snippets of insight throughout our program with your followers. We'll even retweet some of your comments. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. So we'll be hearing from Imad Moulin, Chief Technology Officer at Everbridge. Mr. Moulin is responsible for Everbridge's market strategy, product direction, and research and development. Uh, he's also a regular presenter at industry, technology, and academic conferences, including APCO, NEDRIC, the World Conference on Disaster Management, Cloud Connect, Interop, Internet World, and the MIT CIO Symposium. He is frequently quoted in leading publications, including the New York Times, USA Today, BBC News, Business Week, CNN Money, Fortune, Forbes, Investors Business Daily, uh, Network World, CIO Zone, and Information Week. Uh, Mr. Moulin is a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and has been awarded four U.S. patents. We are excited and honored to have him with us today. So now I'd like to turn it over to our presenter. Uh, Imad, you may begin. Uh, thank you, Erin. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I'd be happy to go over some of the uh, Boston events, as well as the overall timeline, give you an inside look as the, Everbridge, as the Everbridge perspective, what we saw behind the scenes, discuss some of the best practices that we saw really being used and that helped immensely in the aftermath of both the first and second events and then talk a little bit about what that means going forward. So first, a little bit of background. Um, the Boston Marathon obviously is just the world's oldest you know, at this point. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. I think I still remember when it was just a couple of hundred people or entrance initially, and, and, and it was considered a fairly uh, quaint event um, just a couple of decades ago. Now, obviously, it's one of the most widely viewed sporting events uh, in the world, one of the best known road racing events with 27,000 race entrants. So as far as the uh, uh, timeline and of events, let's recap what happened. At around 2.49 p.m. on Monday, Marathon Day, Patriots Day here in Massachusetts, two explosions about 12 seconds apart blocked the finish line on Boylston Street. So three people were killed. Um, many, many people were injured. And obviously, we've all seen the uh, uh, video and horrific photos uh, from the scene. Now, uh, a few days later, the identities of the suspects were released. And more really chaos ensued at my uh, alma mater. A uh, great police officer was, was killed at MIT. An SUV was hijacked, and obviously uh, a series of new events started happening. Uh, on April 19th, shootout with police. Again, many of us have seen the video footage of that shootout as it happened or shortly thereafter. Uh, one suspect was pronounced dead after being taken to a hospital and a manhunt began for the second suspect. And you know, finally, on April 20th, a shelter in place was ordered for local towns, including all of Boston, Watertown, 
where the suspect was at, uh, finally apprehended, and um, Waltham. So quite an eventful week uh, for those of, us, those of us living here in the Boston area. Now, let's take a look at it from a communications perspective and overall timeline. So what was the role of communications during um, these events? There were really two major phases to the event life cycle, and each had its own unique individual timeline. Obviously, the first one, the overall explosion, and then you know ultimately the manhunt and all the events surrounding it. And as you can imagine, communication was absolutely paramount, was critical. Uh, from the very beginning, communication was certainly used to coordinate a variety of activities, uh, whether it was police or fire or hospitals, to keep people informed during these circumstances. One of the most important things that the public is looking for is for that information, but all possible, factual. And what we saw, and we'll discuss this at quite a bit of, of, uh, of, of at quite a bit of length here, is that most of the communications that you probably haven't heard of were really used not in the state and local government space, not. Uh, for uh, emergency responders, but really used by corporations, by businesses big and small, to inquire about the health and safety of their employees, their contractors, etc., and then obviously to keep them informed as well. And in many cases, this type of communication was also used to request information from the people who were at the scene, for, from residents and other people who might be relevant and might be able to provide material information about what's, what's, as to what's going on. So here's a different perspective on the overall um, events, as well as some of the communications that really went out uh, across the board. And you can see here, what we did here is we took a, um, a pretty wide swath or cut across multiple industries. So at the beginning, obviously, you can talk about uh, emergency responders, fire police, using the system in order to either set up command posts, um, activate emergency responders, and ultimately you know, let the appropriate people know that an incident was afoot. But soon thereafter, the appropriate notifications went out to lock down or close a variety of public facilities, some of which were literally at the finish line of the marathon. So a lot of the public facilities that we're talking about here, whether it's the convention center, the public library, were right there. And obviously getting the information out as quickly and as efficiently as possible is absolutely key. But one of the things that really amazed me the most, in looking back and looking at all this amazing amount of data that uh, we were able to review once all of these events were over, was to see the timeline and how quickly Several entities really responded, as well as started communicating with a variety of constituents. So one thing that was um, just absolutely amazing to me is to see some uh, corporations start inquiring about the well-being, the safety of their employees literally minutes after the first explosion. Right? The first corporate communication inquiring about safety of employees went out literally nine minutes after the explosions happened. Now, in addition to that, there were some communications that kept going literally for days afterwards. So in some cases, it was as simple as, are you OK? Do you need help? Or please check in. We had, for example, a Fortune 500 company where the CEO himself wanted to see confirmation reports and did not go to sleep until 100% of employees, whether they were in the area or not, reported back that they were fine, that they were OK. And the system was used to not only send out that initial broadcast, but to continue following up and ensuring that ultimately even those stragglers at the very end responded that they were OK. Nothing short of 100% was good enough in that corporate setting. We also heard time and time again from the likes of Arnold Worldwide who did a fantastic job keeping employees 
abreast of everything that was going on every step of the way, especially given that they had offices a couple of blocks away from the um, location of the initial incident. So again, lots of different communications for a variety of different reasons across the board, and then ultimately April 19th, we started seeing um, the, the manhunt start and obviously more communication, more um, uh, uh, notifications out there about things like travel being shut down, whether it was taxis or the T, aka the subway here in the Boston area, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the cascading effect with Amtrak being shut down and so on and so forth. And then the shelter-in-place citywide notifications going out to let people know to please stay home, let businesses close, and that again had an impact on a variety of businesses and corporations, including us here at Everbridge. We have offices in Waltham, another one of uh, the towns that were locked down with the shelter-in-place notification. And then once the shelter-in-place was lifted, the suspects were apprehended, there were actually some thank you messages being sent out to the residents to let them know that they're cooperation was very much appreciated and all of that during um, as, as part of one big event. And again, one thing that we will talk about in a little bit is the fact that while I mentioned mostly local um, entities, organizations, corporations, hospitals that were affected, communications here really were key to organizations nationwide because of a cascading effect, because ultimately others were put uh, in a state of alert. And also because in some cases many multinationals may have had employees either in Boston at that time or simply people coming in for the marathon to run or to watch and therefore ensuring the safety of their employees even if they did not have any sort of presence in the Boston area was absolutely key. So let's talk about a couple of best practices, some that we absolutely saw being practiced during these events. One, communication was absolutely key during every single stage of the crisis. Now, obviously, during the initial event with the Boston explosions, there may not have been a warning stage, right? Ultimately, the incident happened, but these threat timelines can be incredibly quick, right? Being able to respond as quickly as possible, especially when there are injuries and casualties, is absolutely critical, and that's exactly what happened, right? Communication needs to be absolutely clear. Let people know exactly what to do and what you expect of them. And then, just as importantly, keeping people informed, especially when you're dealing with large populations and events that may seem a little bit chaotic, and in this case, a lot chaotic across the board. So repeated communications, and again, whether that was by state and local uh, officials, emergency personnel, hospitals, or certainly from what we saw, corporations and businesses keeping their employees informed as to the status of offices being open or closed or where to go and what to do was absolutely key. Next, messages. As I mentioned before, the right message can make all the difference in the world. Now, if at all possible, we always urge you to create the right message in advance as early as possible. Even if you don't necessarily know who exactly what that incident is going to be, the follow-on messages, what happens if an office is closed? What happens if an office is open? Where do you direct people? What are the most frequently asked questions going to be? Plan these messages in advance for as many scenarios as possible. Create the right message or the right way that you're going to actually reach out to people because that will make it a lot easier once the incident happens. Again, time is of the essence. Having the right template, and we certainly help you with that quite a bit. You can literally, with one click, send out a notification with the right message to the right people in the right way. 
to all your constituencies, whether that's 500 employees or whether that's 250,000 residents. Now, that's not always possible. That is not always possible so that, in some cases, some of the messages need to be created on the fly. Again, you'll try to prepare for as many of these scenarios as possible, but some of the messages may have to be created on the fly. So you need to be able to support quick creation, quick delivery of these messages. As always, you need to keep it short, readable, and actionable. So you have to think ahead of time, even if you don't know what the message is going to be, but you need to be prepared from a best practice perspective to know exactly what you're saying. So what is the message? Who are you saying it to? Am I sending it to a list of people? Am I sending it to emergency personnel? Am I going into a map and drawing an area? on a map and sending it to anybody who lives within a mile of the scene or to an entire city. Again, I need to know and be able to execute quickly on selecting the recipients. And then I need to remember to set, if it's not already at the fault of mine, how these messages are going out. That's the how. Am I going to go through two cycles? as in try them once and then try them again through every single path? Am I going to try multiple modes? I'm going to send out that text and make that cell phone call and that landline call, etc., and then wait and then try again. Again, these are the sorts of things that you can plan ahead of time, but you should still be able to make a quick decision right then and there and then click on send. So plan as much as possible ahead of time, especially for the subsequent follow-on messages, but be ready to send a message on the fly as quickly as possible, keeping in mind the what, the who, and the how. Next, what are you going to say? The message construction is absolutely critical. Now, we've talked in the past but the Chandler method, the 3330 rule, you have to be clear and concise. And whatever it is that you do, ultimately, you, that what you say has to be actionable. So keep it to three sentences, three key messages, no more than that. And if at all possible, around 30 words. Try to keep it within a single SMS message, if at all possible. And obviously, if you have a point you're trying to make through audio, Make it in the first nine seconds and ensure that whatever message you leave, if at all possible, from an audio perspective, that it's within 30 seconds at most. Remember that during a crisis, the average reading comprehension for people drops by about four grade levels. So ultimately, what you want to be able to do is let people know in very concise terms what the situation is, what that means for them, and what they should do. That's an example of three things you can convey very quickly. What's going on? Hey, what about me? What does it mean for me? Because really, ultimately, in a crisis, it's about me. And then, what do you want me to do now? What's the situation? What about me? What do you want me to do? So we're going to take a look at a couple of the messages that were actually sent out. I'm only now going to show you and talk about any communications that were made publicly. Obviously, I can't share with you necessarily the communications that private companies made internally, but anything that went out to residents that could sign up voluntarily, I'll be able to share with you throughout this talk. So, as an example, again, pretty good. Wh who is the message from? What is the situation? What should we do? Same thing with Watertown. Please remain in your homes. If you hear or see anything, here's a phone number to call. Clear, concise, with specific directions. Telling you about the situation and about what to do. Again. Sometimes creating a short message 
is a lot more difficult than it sounds, but it is critical. You don't want people to be confused. You don't want the message to be ambiguous. You want it to be clear. You want it to be actionable. And again, you have to realize that the sender as well as the recipient will be in a crisis and emergency situation with reading comprehension dropping quite a bit, and therefore you need to take that into account. Next, whether you're dealing with a communication that's going out to one person or one million people, do not think of it as calling a million phone lines or sending a million texts. You are dealing with human beings. You are targeting individuals. You are trying to reach people. Keep that in mind. You need to account for these people ultimately that you're trying to reach. Regardless of the numbers, they're still individuals. I cannot tell you that one particular mode is always going to be better than another that landlines will always be more effective than trying to reach somebody via a cell phone or via text. No single delivery method is going to be 100% effective 100% of the time. It depends on a huge number of factors. Everything from demographics to the state of the infrastructure to things that might be outside your control and ours. Your best approach is to increase the likelihood of reaching people as quickly as possible. And to do so, having multiple ways of reaching people is the only way. The more ways you have of reaching these individuals, the higher the likelihood of being able to reach them. So yes. An email may not necessarily be the best way to reach them most of the time, but add it to the list. Add that text so you can send them an SMS. Call their cell phone. Call their work phone, their home phone. Try those electronic paths first because, again, if voice lines get congested, the electronic paths might be able to get through more quickly. But, again, it's not just a technology or technical issue. We are dealing with human beings with different preferences, with different ways of thinking. In some cases, their preferences are what matters the most because ultimately you need to get them the message. You need to get them to pick up the phone or answer it and look at the instructions if it's a text or an email. And it all varies based on that human being. The more ways, the better. Now. In situations such as what happened, whether it was on the 15th of April or on the 19th and the 20th, you also want to make sure that you're not contributing to the problem. Again, you know, sending out a large communication to a small concentrated area might tax the infrastructure in a way that might have repercussions. So part of what you want to be able to do is, again, use these multiple modes. You're targeting the individual. Again, it doesn't matter if you have 200,000 people or a million people you're trying to communicate with. Once you've reached somebody, and that's a person, not a device, you stop trying to reach them. Free up some of that public infrastructure to be used for other types of communications. So a, an unintelligent, I'm going to blast a communication out there and hit every mode all the time repeatedly is not the most efficient way of doing it. Once you've reached somebody, stop. You are able to account for them. You've gotten the confirmation that they got the message. Don't try to call them again multiple ways multiple times. In certain areas, smaller towns or businesses with just a few incoming PBX lines, you don't want to overwhelm their infrastructure. 
Let's make sure that you're turning on your call throttling options, which can actually slow down the rate of calls going to a specific prefix, a specific area code, or even the entire size of a broadcast, because you want to stay in tune with the inbound capabilities or capacity of a business, a town, or even a state. Don't contribute to the problem. And again, using multiple modes can certainly help. Texts were able to get through much more quickly, much more easily on certain, um, at certain times than, say, cell phone vo voice calls were able to. But again, by using a multimodal approach, ultimately, we were able to reach the individuals. That was key. Now, one of the key aspects of what we started seeing more and more of, and that I would stress is extremely important, is leveraging more two-way communications. Now, this is a practice that's a lot more common in the healthcare world, so hospitals, the corporate world, et cetera, to ask more detailed questions and have those, and those, those responses come back and automatically be analyzed. But sending polling notifications, multiple choice, and expecting a response to come back, always asking for confirmations, not only so that the broadcast can be stopped, but so you can know who acknowledges receives the message. This is absolutely critical in a situation like this because it allows you to confirm the safety of individuals, their availability to work, for example, their status, etc. And again, depending on how you reach them, it could be as simple as a swipe or a click for them to answer the right message with the right response and ultimately you as the sender, no matter how many people you're targeting, uh, will be able to very cl clearly, at a glance, see how many people are okay, how many people are, uh, might need help, and you can follow up. The system can help you follow up with those people who haven't confirmed or are unreachable. So you can focus your attention on, for example, in this case, the people who haven't confirmed. So you can whittle it down. So if you get a confirmation rate of 65% the first time around, the system can just whittle it down very quickly to just those who have it. That's key. Now, two-way communication can be used in a much, much richer way as well. Remember that now more and more people are carrying these smartphones around with them. So it's a lot more than just about, say, getting a yes or no, I got the message, or answering a multiple choice question. That cell phone that they carry is incredibly powerful. Lots more processing power, but it also has an onboard camera, an onboard GPS, etc. And it would be a lot easier now to get information from the front lines if it can be captured as part of that interactive two-way communication. So those employees or first responders or even residents could be getting their information or that notification not just via text or a phone call but via a push notification to that smartphone. And as part of that response, their location, they opt to share it, is now integrated as part of that response. So I can see, for example, clusters of where information is requested from, where more help is needed. Get photos of the situation on the ground. Even get unsolicited feedback that is not necessarily part of a broadcast that tells me exactly what's going on on the ground right then and there. This is absolutely key because the more information you have, the better 
the likelihood of being able to focus your resources and your attention on the areas and on the people who need it the most, and the better your subsequent decisions will be as to what to do next. Now let me go back to frequency to, to planning. Frequency of use is absolutely key. One of the really fascinating data mining exercises that we went through is to really compare the efficacy and efficiency of the broadcast that went out. And obviously there are a variety of different metrics by which you can judge the success of a uh, an entire communications plan or even a single broadcast. Yes, there are the technical things. Like how many calls were delivered or texts were delivered within what period of time? Um, you know, did you encounter any fast busy signals and any no ringbacks, etc.? Fine. Certainly that's the type of after action report you can go through on, an, uh, on, a, uh, on a, a regular basis. But when you take a step back and say, what's the you know, next level, next measure of success? It goes beyond simply the technical metrics. You know, ultimately, were you able to reach all your employees? Uh, did they all get the message and go to the right office or not go to the office when they didn't have to, 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 to be there? So we actually compared a little bit some of this information based on the frequency of usage of the system. So companies and entities that use the system frequently versus those that don't. And the results are pretty starkly different. Repeated use of the system, whether it was for drills or everyday use for communications, made a huge difference. And I can tell you that number one reason is the data quality. Now you're going to ask me what's data quality in this case? Data quality in this case is simply do I have the right contact information so that at crisis time when I try to reach out to my constituents, be they residents or employees or staff or contractors or friends, that I actually have all of them loaded in the system, they're already accessible, and the information is factual, correct, up to date. Because if the information is four years old, likelihood is they may not be up to date anymore. And the best way to ensure that you have that information is to use it on a regular basis. Now, if you don't have um, a use for everyday use for something like this, then again, frequent drills are absolutely key. But the number one reason for success in this particular case is first to have the appropriate information in the system. The best message in the world, right, most powerful system isn't going to help you if the information that you have about your contacts is not up to date. Okay. Next is, of course, there is this um, conditioned response. If you use the system frequently enough, then both the senders and the recipients will know what to do, right? So the administrators, the people sending out the communications will know what to do, especially at times of crisis, reducing errors, no more shaky finger syndrome, oh my, I'm about to send, to, to send a, a, a notification um, to my entire company, including my boss and my boss's boss, or I'm about to do that for, 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 for a city of 250,000 people. And then for the users, knowing what to do, being conditioned, not saying, what is this? Is this real? Should I really follow the instructions? You're conditioned what to do. You know who the message is coming from, and you can do something about it. So again, the non-emergency use, as well as testing or drills, is what helps condition people and ultimately make sure that you have all the data. You didn't miss an employee that just started yesterday, and again, there are several processes that you can use to ensure that, that happens from a technical perspective, but again, that information will be just as good as how it was input, and the only way to truly understand if it's really good is to test it on an ongoing basis. 
So let's take a look at a few more best practices and also uh, some interesting aspects of what happened um, during the uh, shelter in place and beyond. One of the things that you should really pay attention to and realize is that there is going to be a cascading effect. Now again, a lot of the entities, organizations, companies that we talked about happen to be local. But the thing to realize is that um, the, there are other entities and organizations that are paying attention at the same time. So when the T or you know the subway here in Boston was shut down, so was North Line, in Connecticut, so was Amtrak. This is going to have a cascading effect regionally and potentially nationally. We had airports all the way out to, on the West Coast who all of a sudden went on heightened alert. Corporations, as I mentioned before, that they may have been headquartered in New York or in San Francisco, but knew or guessed that they may have employees in the Boston area. So just because an event like this is local doesn't mean that its impact is going to remain local. So certainly geography is key, but also the type of industry that you're in and simply the similarity in terms of scope and size uh, and extent. So you are part of this network. So whether you are in Texas, San Francisco, or LA, or certainly New York or Hartford, this will affect you from a business continuity perspective, from a security emergency perspective across the board. So it is key that you understand if you're at the center of a crisis, what cascading effect you will have. And if you're not at the center of it, the fact that it might affect you as well. Will you have employees that are stranded somewhere? Because all of a sudden, maybe they'll be able to fly into Logan, but they may not be able to get to the city. Or they have flights out of Logan Airport, but they cannot get to it. So having that level of understanding is absolutely key. Let's go back and review a couple of what happened, a couple of things that happened at that time. So communication during those events really allowed a certain level of control of these cascading effects. So when the shelter-in-place communication went out, whether it was in uh, Watertown or Waltham or Boston, that allowed law enforcement to simply do their jobs. They did a fantastic job, but they needed that leeway to get their jobs done, whether that was making sure that the streets were clear, but also ensuring that they weren't being distracted by having multiple events, multiple incidents, as minor as they may be, happening by keeping people in their homes, they reduced the workload on non-incident related activities and kept residents safe, including letting the first responders do their jobs. And again, one of the things that happened and happened really well across the board, corporations, towns, etc., is keeping that communication going. Well, again, it's not necessarily a nice thing to go several days without letting people know, here's what's going on, here are the instructions, here's what we want you to do. Some of the more interesting aspects of uh, uh, technology that was used during this incident was to build and gather situational intelligence through publicly available information. Now, probably all heard there was information that was coming in through social media far faster than through any other mode or channel. Right? It was actually pretty funny to see reporters on uh, some of the major cable news shows that resorted to basically reading tweets on the air because that was where information was coming from. But the interesting thing here 
was to see how this information was being used by certain EOCs and intelligence centers to supplement the information that they had from official channels. Both to be able to corroborate it, but also to ensure that they didn't have to take any additional measures to either quash rumors or uh, move resources or deploy them to deal with situations that were ancillary to the event itself. So here, the ability to get that information automatically, mine that data from these environments, Twitter and so on and so forth, have the system analyze them automatically, send out notifications when certain thresholds around a congregation of tweets about certain keywords being reached, um, all of that was absolutely key. And we expect that this type of capability will be used more and more in the future, given that so much information and misinformation is flowing through the social, uh, the public social networks. The ability to analyze that information quickly, clearly, and automatically will become an even bigger part of these types of two-way communication events. I mean, in this case, we're actually getting information up to the minute, shots heard, views, obviously, um, of the SWAT teams moving in to certain areas. And again, in some cases, as to what happened at MIT, corroboration of what exactly happened in those areas and at what time. So let me tell you about a couple of um, uses in this case that we uh, mentioned you know, very briefly. But um, in, in, in uh, a couple of these cases, uh, Pearson, for example, uh, Executive Vice President, uh, John Lavaca, he, he basically said that they, they used the system um, and it, it first helped them uh, gather the company's incident command team because that team is responsible for implementing the company's safety plan. So automating the ability to get everybody on a conference call as quickly as possible and then using it to notify employees of what happened. Again, keep people abreast of what the situation as quickly as possible. And then ultimately, they wanted to be able to use the system, which they did, to verify and validate that all the employees were safe, especially those who were um, uh, working out of the Boylston Street office, really not very far from that finish line. So they sent a message, made sure that they actually had all the information coming back to them. Um, one uh, employee happened to uh, have been a spectator at the marathon. Um, he was slightly injured, but we, we, we uh, are all uh, praying that he will recover and uh, looks like he's expected to recover fully. So another case here was at Children's Hospital in uh, Boston. Again, um, in this particular case, they're really used to using a system much more uh, frequently to do nurse staffing. So as I mentioned before, as part of the best practices, frequent use is really key because everybody is, in this particular case, used to the system, sending, receiving, they know what to do across the board. So in this particular case, being able to use the system to get people get staff, get nurses onto important conference calls very quickly. So instead of sending out individual pages using a phone, especially given that information was changing so incredibly rapidly, they needed to be able to get that information out as quickly as possible, and they wanted to be able to get everybody on the same page, especially given the developing situation. Again, in this particular case, um, there is this next case was the uh, Massachusetts Convention Center Authority. They operate uh, several convention centers, including the Heinz Convention Center, really, again, not on, uh, right off of Bolson Street, right on Bolson Street, not far from 
uh, the finish line where a lot of crops were gathered. So they were able to uh, notify employees via text, via email, at all the facilities, including the Boston Common Garage, uh, and especially given that some of those areas were going to be swept by law enforcement dogs. And again, here, the idea was not only to keep employees safe, but also let law enforcement officers do their jobs. And again, you have to remember what was happening at the time. There was certainly quite a bit of uncertainty about what might happen next, right? Are there other targets? Uh, can these uh, centers be targets themselves? Because, of course, when I always just think, you know, is there going to be another bomb, another detonation? Are stadiums, are convention centers going to be targets themselves? So they were on the alert using the system to make sure that they could communicate with employees as quickly as possible. And across the board, having that visibility into what else was going on in the city, in the surrounding towns, was absolutely key. And then in this case, last but not least, um, Watertown, where the uh, second suspect was apprehended, right? They were able to actually get the message out incredibly quickly, let law enforcement do their jobs, and kept everybody safe. So in this case, again, local companies used the system to verify the safety of employees. Hospitals used it to relay information to, to nurses. Uh, police, fire, updated citizens with safety messages and alerts. And all of that really worked nicely together and across the board. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, at this point, we are going to open the floor up for questions. Um, so just a reminder, you can use the Q&A function to submit questions. Uh, just make sure you submit to all panelists. So our first question uh, is, how do you go about collecting personal contact information for multiple modes, uh, particularly in this uh, world of mobile and uh, cell phones, uh, and considering the privacy of private individuals uh, who are responsible for those modes? Um, so uh, the answer here depends on uh, what type of industry you're in or vertical. So as far as employees are concerned, if you're dealing with a corporation or a business or even a state or local uh, agency where you're dealing with employees as opposed to residents, so typically you have some information that's available to you in an HR database and the um, uh, uh, process of keeping that information synchronized tends to be fairly simple depending on the complexity of your back-end systems. It could be as simple as having an automated uh, upload of a CSV, so a comma separate values file, on a daily basis, or it can be as, as uh, advanced as a, a real-time uh, RESTful API uh, integration that uh, updates that information after the second. But that isn't necessarily complete information, because it may not have personal information such as cell phone, etc. So part of what we uh, offer and deploy in many cases is a, uh, a private, what we call a member portal, where the information that's coming in from an HR database is locked down, but employees can then log in and add their personal information, knowing that that personal information will not be shared back with the employer. Right? And therefore, they know that the information will only be used in many cases for um, these types of emergencies uh, and so on and so forth. So it could be a personal cell phone, a home phone, et cetera. Now, in the case of uh, a, a town or a state or a county, information can come in from a variety of sources. So certainly you can have the 911 data, which typically is used only for emergencies when you're doing a reverse 911 call, but it can also be uh, uh, 411 data, so white pages, commercial pages when you're trying to, or, or yellow pages or other commercial data which can be used in order to communicate back to businesses. And um, again, that can be supplemented with an opt-in portal. Um, the towns that we've talked about, the cities uh, and entire states have those that are up and running, usually featured pretty prominently 
on their websites, and that allows anybody to come in and register uh, not only their phone numbers, et cetera, but also their address or addresses. So it could be one or two or three or four or five addresses, my work, my home, uh, my kid's school, et cetera. So if there's an incident um, that is impacting one of those addresses and uh, the town or the city decides to send a notification to people around that area, that I know that I get alerted because I've got all the relevant addresses in there. So you can see that a lot of these towns will actually go ahead and uh, push out a, a campaign to get more people to sign up. And typically what you'll see is a big spike in the number of uh, citizens and residents signing up uh, and adding their information simply because uh, they know that something is coming like a Hurricane Sandy or because in, in, um, after really the initial incident like the Boston bombing happened and more people want to be able to sign up to get the inf official information coming in. And again, you know, City of Boston, for example, did a fantastic job with um, uh, urging people to actually sign up. So they kept them notified uh, via Twitter and Facebook and so on and so forth and giving them a direct link to add their information into the system. And so did uh, many other uh, towns and, and, and cities in the area. And you see that happen on a fairly, a fairly frequent basis. Great. Thank you. Uh, our next question is around the specifics. Uh, of best practices for building situational intelligence from social media. Uh, so what do you look for? How do you choose keywords? Uh, how do you process that, that volume of information? Uh, part of it is, is, is a, 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 some of it is an art, some of it is a science, you know, across the board. So if you're dealing with just Twitter, for example, right, there are really three aspects to it. Um, you've got your keywords, you've got your hashtags, uh, and, and certainly you've got your location or the geolocation of the tweets. And part of what you're looking for is an abnormality, right? So typically uh, you might be looking at uh, a hashtag, which typically will change from event to event. So as soon as you see that there is one that's been created that's trending, you can actually have a, a filter or a threshold set up for that so that if the volume spikes, for example, you'll know that something has changed and you want to come in and take a look at it and you'll see that result. Um, of all that analysis right in front of you and you can make an overall decision. Again, the idea there is it's, it's completely integrated with the full-blown notification engine so that the appropriate people or the appropriate teams, based on the topic at hand, are notified as soon as the situation develops. So as soon as an abnormality is seen, either in the volume of tweets that are coming in based on that particular hashtag because uh, uh, the volume was pretty low and all of a sudden it went way up, or potentially because of certain keywords, keywords like explosion. Uh, or fire, or caught, or gunshots that are combined with that hashtag. So you knew that you know hashtag Watertown or hashtag Boston Marathon is going to be trending now. You know instead of just looking through the same information being recycled, you're setting up a filter that basically says, look, if the percentage of tweets now um, that include the words gunshots, it makes up 20% of more of all the tweets. Send out an alert. Let us know and come in so I don't have to keep on watching this stuff. Or if all of a sudden, within a mile radius of uh, your headquarters, you see a large number of tweets that you don't necessarily see, same thing. That's key. And again, that's just one data feed that's part of that situational awareness. There are others. Again, the information coming in from your own people, your own team, through that two-way mobile member application, additional information which might have to do with weather. All of those are what gives you that situational intelligence in one place that combines the specifics of what's going on, even if the source of information might be numbered in the thousands or the millions in this case, that's completely aggregated and analyzed, to overlaid on top of your locations of where your people are, where your assets are, et cetera. Great, thank you. Uh, so there are actually quite a number of questions related to a recommended frequency of testing or use of the system, as well as updating your uh, database. Um, and, and again, this is one of those answers that uh, it, it, uh, it depends uh, on the type of data that you have, et cetera. If you're dealing with an opt-in, obviously the information there is constantly changing. So it certainly helps from time to time to have a reminder for, to people to go back and check to make sure that you have the right cell phone, et cetera. And again, a lot of uh, cities, towns, states will do that on a regular basis and send out a little notification and say, please make sure that your information is up to date, or they'll even post that. Um, on, on uh, social media networks, et cetera, together. If you're dealing with a database, for example, an HR database or a payroll database, um, 
uh, uh, typically, you have to see how, how frequently does that get updated. In many cases, payroll databases might only get updated once a week or so. So having a batch process that you know, brings back the delta, just the changes, or even the full replace on a weekly basis or monthly basis is typically pretty good. Again, unless you have a, an environment or a company or an institution with an incredibly high turnover, you may not need to go to a real-time integration, even though it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. And as far as drills, it again depends on the frequency of use of the system. Again, if you, do, if you are using the system to do uh, 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 staffing and workforce management, then your need to do drills on an ongoing basis, at least to know that your data is good, is not as pressing. But ultimately, you really want to make sure that you have these drills going on say on a quarterly basis, at worst on a yearly basis, but you know, in that particular case, you might be taking some chances. But again, not only will the people not be familiar with the system in terms of what to do, what to say, how to send it out, or the recipients, but also the fact that if you're not using the, 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 the system on a regular basis, you may not even have the right data in place. So drills are absolutely key. Great, I think we have time for just one more brief question. Uh, it's around uh, unsolicited information, and can you just describe what that is in more detail in terms of getting uh, unsolicited information from your employees? Uh, so uh, unsolicited information in, 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 in this case really takes the two-way communication to the next stage. So one-way communication, I'm simply trying to get information out to as many people as possible. Right, the next level of two-way is getting some responses back. At the beginning it was just confirmations, then it can be a little bit richer with two-way polling, it can be even richer with basically having full text information as well as images of the situation um, and other attachments coming back to you so you can actually form a full picture of the situation based on the slivers that multiple people who happen to be there on the ground or in various offices have. So that's the two-way aspect of it. The next part of the two-way is to say, well, I don't actually have to send out a notification to get responses. What if I let people who happen to be on the ground right there send me information, and based on that, I can determine whether a mass communication is needed. So in this case, it could be tips, it could be uh, anything about um, uh, the, the status of an overall office, etc. So it's something that you can enable as part of the system and say, right, through the mobile member application that's uh, easily and freely downloadable by all my employees, uh, or in some cases by all my citizens, staff, and so on and so forth, I can create the variety of categories that automatically show up completely dynamically. So it can be anything from employee check-in to I need help, and the employees themselves, or again the recipients in this case, no matter uh, what vertical you're in, can determine, given the appropriate situation, to send back or to send or initiate a message to you. So they'll select a category. Again, it could be anything from I need help to uh, I'm, I'm checking in. Um, to there is a specific activity going on. You decide on what those categories are that show up, select the category, put in the message, say send. They can attach a photo again if it's something they want to be able to report. And the whole idea there is you get enough of this information that's corroborated across the board and you get a much fuller, much better picture of what's going on and you can determine what to do. Key here, again, is that two-way communication that can go in both directions with the same level of richness. Because for you, right, as the emergency manager or the business continuity planner or whatnot, you want as much information as possible as long as it's not overwhelming. The fact is, you know, the system can analyze it, categorize it, put it in the appropriate locations, et cetera, without any issues. And then you want to make sure that you hear as much as possible from what's going on and have as accurate and corroborated information from what's going on on the ground as possible. And this is what two-way communication enables, especially if it is richer. Great. Thank you so much. So I'm very sorry to announce we've run out of time for the Q&A session. Thank you, Iman, for a wonderful session and to all of our attendees who were able to join us today. Uh, if you missed any part of the webinar, be sure to look for the slides <coughs> on blog.everbridge.com. Uh, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording uh, in the next few days. If you haven't already, please take a moment to follow us on Twitter at, at Everbridge and join our group on LinkedIn, Emergency Incident Management and Emergency Notification Professionals. For those of you interested in seeing a demo of the new Everbridge system, please visit everbridge.com slash contact us to request a demo. Uh, so thank you all for participation in today's webinar. I um, hope to see you again online soon. Have a great day. <laughs>